Who would imagine that we would have a festival sell out, waiting room only, and absolutely everybody loving the vegan message? How awesome is that? Should we just like go crazy because it's bloody amazing? I love it. I'm so proud to be here. I'm Karen Ridgers, I run Veggie Vision TV, and I'm super best friends with this lovely man, Tim Barford, standing next to me, and I'm so proud to be part of the VegFest team um, and one of the media partners. Um, I just wondered, we've got more people, come in, come in, take a seat, come in, come in, don't be shy, it's like I run my own stall or something, come on in. Who here, I just wanted to know, just really quickly, because I know you've not come here to see me. There's someone a little bit more exciting for you to see. Who here is a non-vegetarian? Who here is a meat eater? Anyone? Don't be shy. Oh, come on, there's got to be at least one. They're all too scared. Well, you know what? Yesterday we had a couple and we gave them a huge round of applause because it's wonderful that so many people are coming to the VegFest who are not vegetarian or vegan. There's many, many people here, and maybe you're too shy to say it at the moment, but there's so many people here that are meat-eating people, and my God, have they got a wonderful surprise when they come through the door and see the abundance of vegan food and vegan stuff that has never... We've never had to harm an animal to live or to eat. Come on in, come on in. Who here is a vegetarian? Oh, come on, seriously? There's a few people that are vegetarian. And I've got to say, guys, I don't mean to be controversial or mean or horrible, but come on, if you're a vegetarian, don't you think you've been vegetarian long enough? So who is vegan? Oh, well, you know what? Yesterday I said, well, you're vegan. You're not going to get a round of applause because you're a bloody vegan anyway. But now we have got so... Oh, my God, I feel so blessed to be standing in front of you. Let's just go mad because I really want the loudest room in the whole veg fest. And we're vegan. Let's just absolutely go bonkers and have a huge round of, a of applause for being vegan. <laughs> now, you know what? Tim Barford, without this man who is seriously making the biggest difference to veganism in the UK, in my humble opinion, without this man, you wouldn't be here, they wouldn't be here. Let's just have a huge round of applause and he is going to introduce our speaker as well. Let's give it up for the Tim Barford, who I love so dearly. Oh, Karen, thank you so much. That's a lovely introduction. When we said we had the original Essex girl here, not a patch. Tawi can't have a patch on Karen, although Karen, you do shop at Tawi, don't you? Yeah. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's, it's an extreme uh, pleasure for my job to be able to introduce all our headline acts and our guest speakers and uh, all uh, the amazing people that come over the years to speak at VegFest. We've been going now 13 years. Um, we're hoping not to go too much longer because we're hoping that within another few years the whole country will be vegan and there won't be a need for shows like this because you just go anywhere in the UK and you get vegan everywhere. Uh, but whilst we're still doing these shows, it's my privilege and honour to be able to introduce some of our people. And today's uh, keynote speaker is um, a very interesting gentleman, professor, as you know, um, He's been described many things, but I've got one word for him. Legend. So. <laughs> I'm deeply, deeply grateful that uh, our speaker has made the effort to come. It's a long way, as you know. Um, and especially right now, uh, because there's always last-minute hitches and things that can happen. Um, and really, there has been a big effort made to come here to speak to you directly with a message that I personally think needs to be heard loud and clear all over the world. Without further to do, would you please put your hands together, Mr. Professor Gary Francion. Can you all hear me without using the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that okay with, the, with you in the back of the guy who's for you? Because I, I really don't like using these things. And I teach in a room this size, so it's I'm used to it. Um, all right. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Tim Barford, uh, who is, um, uh, the other day somebody uh, described to me that the, um, the head of the Humane Society of the United States of America, which I think is a terrible organization, uh, was the most powerful person in animal protection. And I, I said, no, that's not true. That's Tim Barker. Um, what he's doing is actually quite remarkable. And, um, and I think that, um, that his efforts are um, of a magnitude that um, are highly significant. And you should be glad to have him here. I wish we had somebody like him in the U.S. We unfortunately do not. Okay. Um, let, me say, let me say as a preface, some of the things I'm going to say today will be controversial. Um, and I don't mean to impugn or question the sincerity of the people who do the animal welfare thing. I don't. I, I believe that they are sincere, but I sincerely believe they are wrong. We've had animal welfare now for 200 years. We are exploiting more animals now in more horrific ways than at any point in human history. I think it ain't working. you think the animal welfare approach works, then just keep doing it. That's fine. I don't, you know, that, that I, I, I'm sure that you are making a sincere judgment, and I encourage you to sort of go out and do your thing. If you agree with me that it's a disaster and that the animal movement is getting nowhere, that it's, that it's a movement which moves back, then I encourage you to think about some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. This presentation was done with my partner, Anna Charlton. She could not be here. This is from a book that we are, we are just finishing. It's actually probably going to be out in the next month or so. Um, called An Introduction to the Abolitionist Approach to Animal Rights. All right. Um, there are six principles with the abolitionist approach to animal rights. The first principle is that all sentient beings, humans or non-humans, have one right, the basic right not to be treated as the property of others. If animals matter morally, if they are not things, okay, it's a binary world. They either have moral significance or they don't. If they have moral significance, they cannot be property. Why? Because to be property means to be something that has no intrinsic or inherent value. Okay? It is to be something that has only extrinsic or external value. It is to be a thing. It is to be a something, not a someone. Now, we recognize this in the human context. We can debate various forms of discrimination as to whether they can be justified or not, but we all agree. Indeed, one of the few principles of customary international law, of, there are only a few principles that are accepted by all nations, okay? One of those principles is that human slavery is wrong. Why is human slavery qualitatively different from other forms of exploitation? Because if you are a slave, you're not in the moral community at all. You're completely outside the moral community. Someone else, your owner, has the ability to value you and may value all of your interests and your life at zero. Okay? You have no value except that which is accorded to you. Your valuation of yourself is simply not respected. You are a thing. You are not a person. This is why everybody 
recognizes slavery is wrong. That doesn't mean to say that slavery doesn't exist. It still does. Unfortunately, it still does. But nobody defends it. When they find, you know, when, when some story comes out about, about slavery, that slavery's been discovered someplace, nobody jumps to the defense of slavery and says, well, you know, this is really not a bad thing. As they do other forms of discrimination, people debate other forms of discrimination as to whether or not, you know, certain, certain benefits should be given to people or whether certain benefits have to be given to people in order for them to be equal, etc. People debate those things. Nobody debates the morality of slavery. Everybody recognizes it as a, a violation of the fundamental right of a person to be a person because if a human is a slave, then the human cannot be a person, the person, if the human is a thing. There can be no balance. We can't, you know, we can't balance the interests of property and non-property because you know, one of the things that animal welfare seeks to do is to balance the interests of humans and non-humans. You can't balance the interests of, uh, I mean, you can't balance the interests of property and property owners. Property owners always win. There were all sorts of laws that protected slaves when we had race-based slavery, which, which existed in the, in the, in, in, in the, the, um, the, the British Commonwealth. It certainly existed in the United States. And so we had laws that protected slaves. Did the laws work? No because they involve situations in which there were conflicts between slave owners and slaves. If you're gonna have a system of slave, slavery, slave owners have to win. Slaves can't win, or else you don't have slavery, okay? So there can be no balance of interest when you're talking about slaves, the slave owners lose. All humans have the right, are considered to have the pre-legal moral right not to be slaves, irrespective of their personal characteristics. So it's not something we give to only smart people or to beautiful people or to talented people. It's a, it's, you have it by virtue of the fact that you are a person. We might have issues at the margins, for example, what if somebody is irreversibly comatose? Um, you know, is, is, you know, can we use that person as a, as a resource to take organs out? Well, you know, I mean, what have they said before they got into the, the, the comatose state, et cetera. But, but basically, we regard all sentient beings, all beings, and sentience is not a complicated concept, it just means you're subjectively aware. You're perceptually aware, you're subjectively aware. All sentient beings, all sentient humans, are considered to have the right not to be a channel, not to be used exclusively as resources for others. Okay, y'all following this so far? Does there anybody have, you know, you're all all right? Yeah. Is it clear, is it clear? All right, good. All right, animals are property. They have no value except as commodities. Now, you're probably saying, but wait a minute, we have pets. I love my dog, I love my cat, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is yes, they're your property. You can love them if you wish because they're your property and you get to decide how to value their interests, okay? So just like you have an automobile, you can choose to take very good care of your automobile to have it maintained properly, and you know you have you have to have it maintained so that you can pass inspection. But you can choose to, to to polish it a lot and take a lot of you know care of it, or you can just let it basically rot as long as it can get through inspection. Okay, because it's your property. You can value it high. You can value it low. That's what happens. That's one of your rights as a property owner. Same thing with your dogs and your cats or your birds or whatever you have. Um, that that you, you can value them, you can value them high, you can love them, you regard them as members of your family, and you can also dump them at a kill shelter today. You can take them to a veterinarian to be killed. You can't legally abandon them in most places, but people do. The bottom line is you can value them high, you can value them low, but they're your property, okay? Now, the, the, the justifications we, we, we've given to treat animals, to justify our treatment of animals as property, we basically say, well, they can't use language, they aren't rational, they can't use abstraction, blah, blah, blah. You know, all of these, you know, throughout history, we've tried to justify our treatment of animals as things by pointing to certain characteristics that they lack, okay? But the bottom line is, this is a completely speciesist way of looking at things because the, the, there is no defect 
that animals have, whether it's the inability to, to I mean, I, 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 I believe that animals, that not human animals, at least many of them, can, can engage in rational thought that they do use abstraction, but it doesn't really matter. All that matters is sentience. And, and, and um, there is no defect that animals have, assuming that they aren't rational, they aren't, they aren't able to use abstract concepts, they can't use symbolic communication. Let's assume that that's all true. There are some humans who can't do that, but we would never think of using those humans exclusively as resources for uh, uh, other humans. As a matter of fact, in my country, you would have a complete lack of cognitive characteristics. You could be a complete idiot and we'll make you president, as George Bush was. <laughs> was <laughs> You know, we need to recognize that if we aren't going to be speciesists, and we're going to say that all sentient humans, irrespective of how smart they are, or how not smart they are, or how beautiful they are, or how not beautiful they are, or whatever, they all have the right not to be treated as chattel property. They all have the right not to be treated exclusively as a means to the ends of another. Okay? And so do animals. So do non-human animals. As long as they're sentient. Now you say, well, what's the sentient? Who's sentient? The answer is, you know what? Um, it, I get this question all the time. Are, are clams sentient? Are oysters? I don't know. I don't eat them. Um, you know, they may be sentient. There is some indication that they're sentient, that there's some indication that they're not sentient. Um, but so I don't, I err in favor. I always err in favor of not killing. Um, and so I don't eat them. Same thing, I don't walk on grass generally uh, because I don't, I don't know whether insects are sentient. Um, my guess is many are probably not, I don't know. I just, I simply don't know. And so I err in favor of not, um, I, I don't want to kill them. And when I live in a, in a rural, um, I no longer live in New York City, and I, um, I live in a rur more rural environment. And there are all sorts of, of, there are spiders that have a lot of hair and, 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 and snakes, and we have all sorts of interesting things, and, and all sorts of, of insects. And you know, I catch, I, I've overcome my fear of them, and I now catch them and go with glasses and things, and I put them outside, um, unless they're too big, and I just leave them alone. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but you know, so, so, but as long as, if, if an animal is sentient, then if we are not going to be speciesist, then we have to recognize that that sentient non-human has the fundamental right that all sentient humans have, the right not to be treated as property, the right not to be a thing, the right not to be treated exclusively as a resource, exclusively as a means to the ends of others. But that requires that we abolish animal exploitation. Once you reckon, you see, people say, well, but you're just talking about this one negative right. You're not talking about positive rights. You're talking about the negative right of the animal not to be property. That's right, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about positive rights, I'm talking about the one, I'm talking about a negative right that all sentient beings have the one negative right not to be treated exclusively as means to the ends of others. And, and recognition of that one negative right requires that we abolish animal exploitation. We simply cannot justify institutionalized exploitation of animals. Now, what about domestication? You say, well, you know, does that mean that we have to end domestication? The answer is yes, that's exactly what it means. It means domestication is a violation of the fundamental right of animals not to be treated as things. And you say, well, isn't that, isn't that going to mean that we won't have dogs and cats in companion? Yes. We, we live with six rescued, abused animals, canines, um, dogs, and, and, uh, which is one of the reasons why we no longer live in New York City. And, um, and I don't think that you'll find anybody on the planet who enjoys interacting with dogs as much as Anna and I do. And if there were two dogs left on the face of the earth, and the issue was whether or not we should have them breed so we can continue to have pet ownership, the answer is not on your life. Domestication is wrong. It should be abolished. If we recognize the fundamental principle of animals not to be treated as things, it means we don't eat them, we don't wear them, we don't use them. We stop bringing them into existence as things that we exploit. The only animals who exist are the ones that exist in, in the wild, and we leave them alone. 
Okay, so that's what that's the first principle of the approach that I promote. Principle two, because principle one concludes with that we should abolish animal exploitation. Principle two is we shouldn't be promoting if we if we agree with principle one. If we agree that if animals matter morally, then we 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 can't treat them as property. We have to abolish their status as property. If we agree with that. We should stop supporting animal welfare campaigns and single issue campaigns. Okay? By the way, Tim, how long do I have? I mean, yeah, 15 minutes. Okay, very good. Okay. 15 minutes total or 15 minutes from now? <laughs> He's going to check the schedule. Another, he's got another half hour. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. All right. The evolution of the Okay. All right. Why does the. Why, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be giving a separate talk. Uh, later on, sometime today, on on the on the problem with the animal welfare approach, and I'm going to be more detailed about it. But let me just say there are six reasons why I think animal welfare reform and single issue campaigns are a very bad idea. The first one is I reject the idea, and if you are an abolitionist, you should reject the idea that the fundamental principle of the animal welfare position is that animals don't have an interest in continuing to live. We bifurcate their interests. We say they have an interest in not suffering, but they don't have an interest in continuing to live because they are not self-aware. I'm going to talk about this more in the, um, I, I was going to talk about it some now, but I don't have time. I will talk about this in detail in the second presentation, or whatever number of presentation it is today, when I talk about the animal welfare, the problems with animal welfare. But the basis of the animal welfare position, going back to the 19th century and continuing to the work today of Peter Singer, I mean, Singer says the same thing Bentham said, you know, in, in the 18th century. Basically, animals aren't self-aware, so we can exploit them as long as we do so, as long as we protect their interests sufficiently. It's all right for us to use them. The issue is not use. The issue is treatment. Um, and and the, the approach that I promote rejects that. Um, you know, the idea that they don't care that we kill and use them, that we use and kill them. Um, they care about how we treat them. That's the fundamental premise of the, a welfarist position. However it manifests itself, all there are different welfarist positions. All of them share in common. That fundamental premise is wrong in my judgment. Um, welfare reform campaigns and single issue campaigns necessarily promote animal exploitation. Now every time, I say this all the time, and every time I say it, I get um, horribly insulting emails and private messages on the Facebook page from people who disagree with it, and I'm not sure they understand it. Um, let me explain what I mean. Animal welfare campaigns and single issue campaigns. Let me give you an example of an animal welfare campaign. An animal welfare campaign is promoting the enriched cage that is now the legal standard in the European community, right? I mean, the, the enriched cage, you get rid of the conventional battery cage and you adopt what you call the enriched cage, which is, that's, that campaign was a campaign for animal welfare reform. It is supposedly making animal exploitation more humane. Okay? An example of a single issue campaign is a campaign against foie gras, you know, uh, uh, which is a, a very popular campaign in Britain right now, which is why I'm using it as an example. This idea that we ought to target foie gras as, as you know, we, ought to, we ought to promote the idea that people should not be eating foie gras. That's a single issue campaign. Why are these things problematic? They're problematic because they both, welfare campaigns, single issue campaigns, require coalitions. Think about it. In order to have a campaign for the enriched cage, you may have people in that coalition who are vegans, but you're going to have people who eat eggs and who just think that, you know, it would be better if we got the eggs. I feel better. I feel less guilty if I ate eggs that were from an animal that, came, that was raised in an enriched cage. So these Welfare campaigns necessarily involve coalitions where you've got people who are, who are animal exploiters and who intend to continue exploiting animals. And you may have some people in that coalition who don't exploit animals and don't think animal exploitation is okay. But you have this coalition. And the only way that coalition holds together is if the people who are going to continue to eat eggs and the people who think there's nothing wrong inherently with eating think that adopting or supporting the enriched cage 
means that we're going to have a, a morally better situation, that it is a morally, it's a normatively morally better thing to eat eggs from enriched cages, and that it is a good thing. So it's prom it promotes, it promotes the idea that we can exploit compassionately. I'm going to talk a, a lot more about this today, and later on in the afternoon, I will be talking with Tony Wardell from Viva. We'll be debating this issue, and I'm sure that you know Tony will have some interesting things to say and uh, about it because we have a very very different view of this. But but I see, there's no way these campaigns work. They necessarily involve coalitions where a good chunk of the people in the coalition are people who will who, who believe that animal exploitation is not inherently wrong. And so the only way, when you think about it, if you're involved, if you say, hey, I support the campaign for, for you know, enriched cage AIDS, you're not gonna be part of that coalition if you understand that campaign is to be saying eating, cage, eating AIDS from enriched cages is also morally bad. You're only gonna support that campaign if you think that, that what you're doing is a morally good thing to do. This is not rocket science, people. This is common sense. Same thing with single issue campaigns. When you have a campaign against foie gras, you've got people who think foie gras is terrible, but they're gonna continue to eat steak and chicken and fish and whatever they're gonna eat. And so there, you've got a coalition of people, many of whom think that eating animals is fine. They just think foie gras is problematic. And I have news for you. There is no difference morally between foie gras, steak, chicken, or anything else. I mean, there is no difference whatsoever. And so what we end up doing is promoting the idea that you can be an animal person by not eating foie gras, but and, and, and go ahead and eat steak. And, and it's wrong to say, well, those campaigns are not saying go ahead and eat steak. They most certainly are, because they are not vegan campaigns, okay? They are campaigns that are basically saying some things are worse than other things, and by implication, those other things are morally better. Um, animal welfare reform campaigns make partners, make animal advocates partners with animal exploitation. I'll, I'll talk about this later. This is a letter that uh, Peter Singer sent in 2005. This is a, an historically extremely important thing. Because what happened was in 2005, Singer sent a letter to John Mackey, who's the CEO of a company called Whole Foods. I think you have them in London. Um, there is a chain of, of high-end supermarkets that sell happy meat and happy eggs and happy cheese and stuff. And Singer wrote a letter in which he expressed his, quote, appreciation and support for the, quote, pioneering animal, you know, the, the pioneering happy exploitation standards of Whole Foods. And it was signed by uh, my buddies at Farm Sanctuary, Humane Society, PETA, Mercy for Animals, Vegan Outreach, and Viva USA. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, I have a. If I can figure out how to how to maybe Reg um, can help me in for the presentation this afternoon. I actually have a sound clip of John Mackey, who's the CEO of Whole Foods, talking about how they had a big meeting with PETA and Farm Sanctuary and Viva, and they all talked about standards of humane exploitation, species by species. So you got animal people sitting in a room with animal exploiters talking about how you can make exploitation humane. Now, if that's cool, if, that, if you're happy with that, if you're comfortable with that, that's fine. I think it's obscene. I would never support anything like that. All right, so and, you know, this, is, this is the RSPCA freedom food. I mean. What is this? I mean, you know, <laughs> what is this? I mean, you know, good cooking, find a recipe. You know, we have lots of recipes for, for, for you to try using all RSPCA assured meat, fish, and eggs, right? And so this is an animal group. This is, these are people who are supposedly interested in animals, okay? Um, and these people are talking about here, here are recipes, and you can make them with our happy meat, our happy eggs, and the other products of our happy exploitation. This is Compassion and World Farming. Okay, Compassion and World Farming has never found an animal exploiter that it doesn't want to give an award to. They give more <laughs> awards. I mean, I mean, Philip Limbery over at Compassion and World Farming, he's made an art form out of, I mean, it, it, he just gives award after award after award after award to all of these. And, and look, this is promoting. You can't tell me that this is not promoting animal exploitation. It most certainly is. You're putting a stamp of approval on it. 
So for people to say, well, you know, we just think that there ought to be less suffering rather than more suffering, but we're not really encouraging animal exploitation. That is completely false. This is encouraging animal exploitation. It's promoting animal exploitation. It's making partners. It's, it's, it's resulting in a partnership between animal exploiters and, and, and um, animal advocates. Here, this is, um, this is Ingrid Newkirk from PETA. This is, Bell and Evans is a chicken supplier. And here's, here's, Pete, here's Ingrid saying, Bell and Evans shows that animal welfare and good business can go hand in hand. And by listening to consumers' wishes, Bell and Evans has set a new standard for the chicken supply industry. This is PETA, an organization I was involved with in 1981. That's, I was the first organization I got involved in when PETA first started. And it was a fairly radical organization back then. We were all vegans. We all promoted veganism. And this is now what PETA is promoting. Happy chicken, OK? This makes partners out of animal exploiters and animal advocates. Animal reform campaigns and single issue campaigns represent a speciesist approach to animal ethics. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Um, would we ever talk about humane pedophilia? Would we ever talk about humane rape? Would we ever talk about humane slavery? When we're talking about the, fund of the violation of the fundamental rights of humans, we never talk about, you know, yes, less suffering is better than more suffering. It's better to whip your slaves nine times a week rather than 10 times a week. But it doesn't mean that feeding them nine times a week is good. I mean, less suffering is better than more suffering, but it doesn't address the problem of the justice and the morality of the underlying institution. So um, the problem with these campaigns, you know, like Meatless Monday, can you, I mean, just think about that for a second, right? Let's imagine we're dealing with an issue of racism. And we say, you know, racism is, is a problem. So let's have racist uh, 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 joke three Monday. You know, let's not tell racist jokes on Monday. Would anybody, you know, or look, rape is a serious problem. I mean, you know, although we have laws against rape, rape is a, I mean, in, in the United States, like one out of four women who gets to college age, and that's just what we know, and I'm sure the numbers are actually worse, but one out of four women have been victims of rape or attempted rape by the time they get to be 22 years old. That's insane. That's a, per, that's a pervasive problem. And a lot of rapes involve violence. I mean, involve violence other, than the, other than the battery of the rape, they involve other forms of battery. So would we start talking about, well, you know, we really need to have humane rape. Would anybody support a campaign like that? And the answer is no. Everybody would agree that less suffering is, more, is better than more suffering, but no one would promote the humane violation of a fundamental human right, okay? But when it comes to animals, Meatless Monday, humane this, humane that, single issue campaigns, it's speciesist. We, uh, we, we treat the fundamental interests of animals, the fundamental rights of animals not to be property, we treat those rights in a way that we don't treat any rights where humans are involved. Single issue campaigns promote discrimination against humans. Um, I'll talk about that later. Uh, what happens lots of times with single, with, uh, with, with single issue campaigns, particularly, is like the fur campaign. There is no difference between fur, wool, leather, silk. All bad. Shouldn't be wearing any of it. But what is the main campaign we've had ever since I was, I got, I got involved in this 30 some odd years ago, almost got a long time ago, more than 30. Um, and when I first got involved, the big issue was fur. And when you went to a fur demo, all it was was like people standing on the street, and every woman that walked by got regaled with really sexist advocates. The whole, the whole anti-fur campaign has been a vile exercise in sexism. You know, um, a lot of the campaigns, some of the campaigns I've seen in Britain about um, consuming non, you know, non-stunned animals have been very Islamophobic. And so, you know, what ends up, we have a campaign right now going on in the United States. Um, some Orthodox Jews participate in a ceremony called kaparot, where they take a chicken and they wave the chicken over their head, and then the, the sins of the person are supposed to be transferred to the chicken, and then the chicken is killed. The chicken has, his, has her throat cut. And a lot of people are really upset about that. And they have these the big demonstrations against kaparot. And I've asked them a million times, could you please include a statement that this is not about what Jews do, you know, that anybody who thinks this is bad, who eats chicken, is doing the same damn thing. 
So like, why single out the single issue campaigns have a tendency to focus on, because what you're trying to do is you're, 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 you're saying, here's our coalition, and we're better than you that because you do this form of exploitation. And what you end up doing is you otherize the other group of people, and the other group of people often involve themselves vulnerable groups, whether they're women, whether they're Muslims, whether they're Jews, whatever. Okay. So, it, it, but again, I'll be talking about that in detail later on. Um, animal welfare cam campaigns and single issue campaigns are ineffective. Animals are property. They, are, they only have an economic value. The only time we protect their interests is when we get a benefit from doing so. The first book I wrote in 1995 was called Animals, Property, and the Law. And what I argued in that book is if you look at the history of animal welfare law, both in Britain and the United States, what you see is that animal welfare reform has done little more than require that we efficiently exploit animals. That is, animal welfare reform tends to focus on things, on practices that are economically questionable or, you know, or vulnerable and where, they, where there is an arguable inefficient use of animals. Let me give you an example. The veal crate campaign, okay? We've got, we're, we're, we're largely, particularly in Europe, um, on the way to getting rid of the, the, the veal calf in the tethered crate. Why? Because when you have a veal calf tethered in a crate, that animal will suffer great stress. The great stress, just like you get stressed, you get sick, they get stressed, they get sick, and they need veterinary care, and the whole goal of the veal industry is to keep those calves healthy, or healthy enough, until you can slaughter them, which is usually at six months of age. So if you take them out of this, this small chute and you put them in a, in a social unit, the veterinary costs go down. So that's an efficient thing to do. The same thing with the campaign, for example, that a number of organizations have to have chickens gassed rather than the way that they're presently killed, which is really horrible. I mean, it's all horrible. How many, I'm, I'm sort of wondering, how many of you have, have ever been in a slaughterhouse? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. A lot of animal people have never, you know, when I, when, whenever I hear animal people talk to me about Temple Grandin and humane slaughterhouses, I always think, are these people on drugs? Because if, they, you know, if you've ever been, I mean, I've been about 30 of them at least in my life. Um, I've stopped, I, I, I mean, first of all, I can't get into them anymore. But secondly, <laughs> but secondly um, I've seen so much of it, I just don't want any more of that in my brain. But, but um, you know, there's no such thing as a good slaughterhouse. They're kidding, all of them are kidding. But, um, but, but uh, there's a big campaign going on to get, um, and to get chickens gassed. Well, I have news for you. If you were going to start a chicken processing plant tomorrow, you would be insane not to use controlled atmosphere killing or, or gassing because that's the economic, I mean, you save money, which is why the industry, as it takes its tax advantages from, you know, because you, you, know, you have the capital expense and then you expense that, you know, you, you, you have your accountants expense that out over a period of years. Once you stop getting the tax benefits, everybody's switching to controlled atmosphere killing because that's the economically sensible thing to do. Same thing with gestation crates for, for pigs, okay? I mean, gestation crates, a lot of piglets get crushed. There's a lot of injury in those things. You're much better off using things like electronic sow feeding, which, is, which actually reduces the production cost of pork. So if you look at the history of animal welfare reform, what you see is all it does is make animal exploitation more efficient. At best, what it does is it may marginally rise, may make the price rise. It never, it never really affects demand because the demand for animal products is what we call, for most animal products, is what we call, what economists call, um, uh, uh, inelastic. That is, you can raise the price a certain amount and demand won't change. So you end up you you end up creating niche markets, you know, where people say, "Hey, I'm buying happy this and happy that," but that's the best you get. And and for all intents and purposes, 90 percent, 95 percent of animal welfare does nothing but make animal exploitation more economically efficient. Principle three: abolitionists believe that veganism is a moral baseline, and that creative nonviolent vegan advocacy is what we ought to be doing as animal advocates. Um, what do I mean by veganism is a moral baseline? What I mean is there are two choices. You are either a vegan or you are an animal exploiter. 
there is no, there's no third choice. Okay, I mean, it's like a multiple choice exam. You got A, you got B, there ain't no C. Okay, and so um, you are either a vegan or you are engaging in animal exploitation. I don't, you know, I, and I don't mean to insult those of you who are vegetarians, but vegetarianism is a completely incoherent moral position. I mean, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's like saying, well, I eat, the, you know, I eat the, the meat from small cows, but not from medium-sized cows. I mean, it's, it's arbitrary. And animals used for dairy products are generally kept alive longer. They're treated every bit as badly, if not worse, than their meat counterparts. And they all end up in the same slaughterhouse anyway. So I mean, you know, what, so this idea that, well, vegetarian, you know, let's be vegetarians. So what? I mean, frankly, I think there's every bit as much suffering and death in a glass of milk as there is in, in, in a steak. So, you know, I mean, um, but, but vegetarianism is not a coherent moral position. If we believe animals matter, we cannot eat them, wear them, use them, period, end of story. It's not complicated. Um, and people talk about vegetarianism as a gateway position. If, if I have, if, if Anna, Anna and I get zillions of emails every day, um, I mean, so I'm talking about like 300, 400, I mean, we get, we get insane numbers of emails. Um, and if there is one theme that pervades, that, 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 that unites emails and communications we get, it's people saying, I'm so happy to have found this because, you know, I've been involved with this group and that group for 20 years, I've been a vegetarian. No one's ever told me I needed to go vegan. And you know, you've got these, these supposed role models. Look at Paul McCartney. I mean, he's been, you know, he's been a vegan for what, 130 years? <laughs> <laughs> for 130 years. And he's still not a vegan. I mean, so, so I don't really care if he's a vegetarian. It just doesn't matter to me. To me, a vegetarian is an animal exploiter. Sorry, sorry, I'm supposed to support vegetarian. Um, but you know, I mean, but that's the reality. You're engaging in the exploitation of animals. Okay, there's no way around it. Um, creative nonviolent vegan advocacy is. I don't think we need all these groups. Frankly, I think, I mean, if this is going to work, you know, the revolution will not be, you know, will not come as a result of charities. It's going to come as a result of a grassroots movement of all of us. We don't need leaders. We don't need groups. We don't need organizations. We don't need teachers. We don't, what we need is we need to get out there and do the work. You don't let you don't write a check and have somebody else do it. You don't donate to somebody else and have that. You do it. And if we do it, if we have a grassroots movement, we can change the world. I mean, I let, just for the hell of it, I, I went, I, I did some research on the number of vegans in the United Kingdom. The lowest number I could find was 150,000. I think it's, I, I think it's higher than that, much higher than that. But I, the lowest number I could find is 150,000. If every one of those 150,000 educated one other person in the coming year, we've got 300, then we've got 600, then we've got 1.2 million, then we've got 2.4, and then we've got 4.8, and then we've got you know 9.6, and then we've got 19 point, you know, et cetera. And in 10 years, we've got 78 million vegans, and there are 63 million people in the United Kingdom. So if every one of us, if every one of us educated one other person, one, in the next year, and then we did that, we'd have a vegan Britain in 10 years. And we can do that. We need to be talented people because they're too stupid. And I, I, I so much object to that. Um, I hope I, I'm, I'm hoping to see my friend Ronnie Lee this week. And Ronnie's here, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. And I'm hoping to see my friend Ronnie Lee because I saw him say something about you know well you know we can't really talk about veganism to people because you know they're just not morally sophisticated enough to understand it. I'm sorry, people. I think that is bullshit, and I do not mean to denigrate bulls. I mean I really, <laughs> I really do think that that is wrong. I think that people understand it. They get it. You know, when I, I, you know what, I don't spend a whole lot of time talking to animal people these days. Because talking to people who are involved in these animal groups about veganism as a moral baseline is really frustrating because they argue with them. I mean, they, they get all upset. They want to support Quad Rock campaigns, they want to support Cage Free Age, Great Report, and all this nonsense. That's what I talk to regular people. 
And I start off by saying, how many of y'all got a dog and or a cat or whatever? And 90% of the audience raise their hand. Okay, fine, you love them, members of the family, blah, 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 blah. And then I say, so why aren't you vegan? And then we have a discussion, which is usually scheduled for an hour, oftentimes goes to three. And, and every time I have one of those, every time Ann and I do one of those things, we will get, out of a group of 100 people, we'll get 10 or 20 people who come up and say, you know what, I never thought about it that way. You know, when I say to them, do you believe it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals? And they say, yeah, I agree with that. And I say, well, but wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with me that whatever necessity means, it means you can't justify suffering for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that, that's simple. Okay, fine, then why aren't you a vegan? Because you don't need to be to eat animal products to be optimally healthy, and, and animal agriculture is an ecological disaster. The only justification, the only justification we have for exploiting the billions and billions and billions of animals and the trillions of fish every year is palate pleasure. Palate pleasure and fashion sense, because we think we look good in it. And that's it. And that, that can't constitute necessity. And you know what? People are not stupid, they get that. And even if they're not going to go vegan immediately, you've planted the seed and you've made the message clear, and so they're not gonna go off and buy cage-free eggs or crate-free pork or, you know, or steak instead of foie gras. They're, they're gonna be thinking about this. They're gonna be thinking, you know, and every time we do one of these things, We'll get 10 or 20 people out of a group of 100 saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking about this. And then you get the emails that, that, that come in, that dribble in over the coming weeks saying, you know, I've tried it. And I tried it, and I, you know, because we tell people, you can go vegan right away. We have a new site called HowDoIGoVegan.com where we try to give people practical information. And we, um, we, you know, we explain to people it's easy to go vegan. There is absolutely no problem with going vegan. It's easy. It's something, you know, I love these people saying, well, you know, how do you learn about nutrition? The answer is, you're eating rotting flesh, you're eating cow mucus, and you're talking to me about how am I supposed to learn about nutrition? You know, I'm, 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 it's insane. And, and so, you know, I always tell people, two hours, two hours, if you're a slow reader, what you need is two hours, and you can learn everything you need to learn about vegan nutrition. I mean, there's not a whole lot to learn. Um, and, but, you know, I will tell people, if you really feel you can't do it, then go vegan for a week for breakfast. And then go vegan for a week, and you'll see that you don't go blind, you know, you don't, you know, you don't lose your, you know, you don't lose your hearing. You know, then, then you go vegan for lunch for a couple of a week or two, then you go vegan for dinner, then you're vegan. And and you know, but I always I always preface it by saying, but please let me explain to you. If you really think animals matter, every animal product you eat in that six or eight weeks in transition, that's something you've got to think about morally because you can't justify that. So, but people get this, you know, and we can do this. If we educate ourselves, it's one of the reasons why we wrote, we wrote the book, Eat Like You Care. That book was intended for people who care about animals who wanted to think about veganism, but it was primarily intended for vegans who wanted to learn how to educate other people about veganism so that they didn't have to talk about complex philosophical issues or whatever. And so, because this is not rocket science. Most people already believe Almost everybody you meet, go, you don't believe me, go outside today at some point, not during one of my talks, but go outside, <laughs> go outside today and just stop people on the street and say, do you think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals? And you know what? You will not get one person who will say, I disagree with that. And that's, they already agree with everything they need to agree with to get to the vegan point. All right. Um, the modern animal movement has rejected veganism as a moral baseline. This is from Viva. Change your, you know, what you can do. Change your diet. Go veggie, vegan, or eat less meat. What is that telling people? That's telling people that eating less meat is a morally acceptable thing to do. I think that's wrong. Right? I, 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 that's not, in my judgment, what we should be telling people. This is animal aid. You know, veggie and vegan. You know, uh, it's basically vegetarian, they talk about vegetarian, vegetarianism and veganism as equal, I mean, they're not promoting veganism as a moral baseline, okay? They're saying, they're not saying, Viva's saying eat less meat. I don't see, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on the site, I don't see animal aid seeing, saying eat less meat, but I do see them promoting vegetarianism, and I think that that's problematic. And then people say, well, we can't be judgmental, and we can't be purists. I have news for you. If this is a movement for justice, and it can't be judgmental, then, you know, to call it, <laughs> this 
this is a movement for social justice. When I hear animal people say, hey, we can't be judgmental, I say, well, then what is this, an exercise in mental masturbation? Because what is going on? <laughs> you no, know, seriously, what is going on? I mean, how, how do you make sense of this? Of course we, I mean, uh, we, 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 we should not be judgmental in terms of being harsh or violent towards other people. Um, you know, uh, uh, other, uh, and, and I, I think it's very important to separate the action from, uh, from the, can I just take a few more minutes, Tim? I promise I, I will. Uh, and we ought not to be uh, criticizing individuals, but we ought to be clear about the actions not being morally justifiable, okay? And you know, people say, well, you're being a purist. Well, you know, yeah, okay, fine. I'm a purist about rape, I'm a purist about racism, I'm a purist about pedophilia. What's wrong with saying, no, I'm an absolutist when it comes to the exploitation of animals. We, we, when it comes to the fundamental rights of humans, we have no problem being, quote, purists. Why is it that we all of a sudden start developing those problems when we're talking about non-human animals? Again, I think that's in the instance of, of uh, speciesism. Principle four, the abolitionist approach links moral significance only with sentience. I don't really care whether non-human great apes are more like us or elephants are more like us any more than I care about whether certain people of color are light-skinned because they're more like me because the white male is the quintessential measure of value in a racist society. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I have a serious problem with these, these campaigns. And I actually have a chapter in the Great Ape Project, which was, came out in 1993. But even then, I was, you know, I mean, my ideas were not what they are now, but, but you know, I, even then I was feeling uncomfortable about the idea that non-human great apes mattered more, that we ought to have campaigns for non-human great apes, or we ought to have campaigns for elephants. Why, are, why do elephants matter more? Because they're like, you know, because they have memories, or, or dolphins are more like, who cares? I mean, you know, the fish values his or her life just as much as the dolphin does, just as much as you do. We all value our lives in different ways. I don't know how you value your life, I'm sure that we all value our lives in different ways. But the bottom line is, is all sentient beings who haven't committed suicide value their lives. <laughs> Um, principle five, we reject all forms of human discrimination, including racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, blah, blah, blah. This idea that it's the animal movement, we only talk about animals, is nonsense. It is complete nonsense. The problem, the reason why we have animal exploitation is we otherize non-humans. If we reject the otherization of non-humans, we are committed to reject. We say, look, you can't justify the exploitation of non-human animals based on speciesism. Well, you can't justify the exclusion of humans from the moral community based on race, or sex, or sexual orientation, or class, or ability, or anything else. As far as I'm concerned, the animal rights movement is a movement of the left. To say that it is apolitical is, in my judgment, nonsense. It is a movement that seeks a to seek that seeks justice broadly for all groups and does not and does not. <laughs> there were a number of reasons why I stopped um, donating my my. Uh, I don't practice law anymore, but when I did, I used to do a lot of legal work for for PETA. And there, one this is one of the reasons why I stopped doing it. It wasn't the only reason why. It was one of the reasons why because the idea that we're going to use the exploitation of humans to bring about justice for non-humans is insane, in my judgment. It's absolutely crazy. So the, 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 the campaigns for PETA have gone from being sexist to being so misogynistic. I mean, I, 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 they just, I don't even look at them anymore because they're just, they just, I, I'm, I am horrified that anybody would ever associate what I believe with that misogyny, that nonsense, that sexism, that violence. That's really crazy stuff. I mean, this, you know, this, look at this stuff. This is, you think this is helping animals? If you think this is helping animals, then uh, I think you're wrong. Principle six, we reject violence. Now, this is something else I get in trouble for. Um, I see the animal rights movement, as I understand it, as the, as, a, as the quintessential peace movement, okay? Um, that is, human violence, has his, violence of humans against other humans, has always sought to be justified 
by taking the group of humans we want to exploit, analogizing them to animals, and then once they're animals, we can do what we want to with them. It's how we did it with blacks, it's how we did it with Jews, it's how we did it with Armenians, it's how we've done it with every single group we've ever exploited. We've analogized them to animals, and then by analogizing them to animals, we then justify our exploitation of them and our exclusion of them from the moral community. I think that's wrong, and I think that we ought to stand for non, look, the idea that violence is ever, if, if violence worked to solve any problem, we'd be living in the Garden of Eden right now because the history of humankind has been a history of violence. Anybody who really thinks that violence is going to get us to justice is, I would suggest, um, someone who should study history a bit, a bit more. Um, there's also, also with animal exploitation, how do you tell who the, I mean, who, who's an animal exploiter? Who's an animal exploiter? I'll tell you a quick story. I'm giving a talk at, at Canadian University five years, years ago. A woman identifies herself as a member of the Animal Liberation Front. She says to me, um, if a vivisector is using 60 animals, 60 dogs a year for vivisection, do you not believe that it's, that it's okay to use violence against that person? And I said, let me ask you a question. Are you a vegan? Yes. Is your mother a vegan? No. What does your mother eat? My mother eats chicken. Your mother eats ch chicken a couple times a week? Yes. Your mother's responsible for more than 60 chicken deaths. Is it okay to use violence against your mother? She said it's different. I said, no, it's not. The bottom line is when you live in a society where 95% or 98% of the people are animal exploiters, talking about violence against animal exploiters becomes lunacy. Okay, because there's no, I mean, we are all complicit in it. So there's no coherent way to segment off some group of people and say they're animal exploiters and we're not, we, those of us who are vegans are not participating directly in animal exploitation. But if you think it's okay to use violence against the vivisector while you're living with somebody who's not a vegan, or your parents are, are not vegans, or your friends are not vegans, and you don't think it's okay to use violence against them, you're not thinking clearly. Um, there is one and only one way we're going to stop animal exploitation, and that is we need to create a grassroots. We don't need these groups. We need us. We just need us, and we need our commitment and our passion and getting out there and not letting a day go talk to anybody you can every single day of your life. We need a grassroots movement. It's the only thing that's going to ever change. We do need revolution, but we need a revolution of the heart. Peace. Thank you. Yeah.